Hello, and welcome to a conversation with Dr. Sharifah Hapsa Said Hassan Shahabuddin, Vice Chancellor of University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Malaysia's national university, and she is also President of the National Council of Women's Organization. Dr. Sharifah, welcome. And thank you. you for making the time. You recently spoke about the Malaysian education system, highlighting how it divides and how it unites within the context of Malaysia's multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multi-religious society. How does the education system divide? The simple reason is in our constitution. There's an article that says um, that protects uh, the rights of uh, mother tongue education. Uh, and uh, the, the result of um, colonial legacy, I think, uh, we have developed, the, uh, in addition to the national system of education, the vernacular education system as well, so that the primary school children can be schooled in their mother tongue. And as a result, what we've seen is um, Chinese parents send their children to Chinese schools, Indian to Indian schools. So we have the national language, Malay, we have Arabic, we have English, private schools use English, Tamil and Mandarin. So this, this is what I mean by education device, because uh, children from an early age in primary school um, are divided along ethnic lines when they go to school. And how does education unite? Uh, in the secondary school, the, 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 it's only in uh, Mandarin and the national language and English and continuation of Arabic. Uh, in university, it's uh, Malay, the national language, and English, but this time it's public and private. So it gets narrower in terms of the division. Uh, how it unites is... Um, in school, there's a national curriculum. Mm -hmm. So even though they divide uh, according to ethnic lines and language, the children use a national curriculum. So basically the content, the goals are the same. We also have what is called uh, the vision schools, mm -hmm. where we put um, the different schools uh, in, in close proximity in one location, and we call them vision schools. So we have a Chinese medium, an, a Tamil and a national type schools being close together and they share uh, common facilities like playing fields and halls and, and other things and so we can have a mix of the students um, in say co-curricular activities and other activities so there is still a chance for them to socialize with each other. Uh, this is an important step I think that the government has taken and we hope such schools will become more popular. But the ideal, of course, is to get all the children going to one school. So what are the ways? And I think some of the steps that have been put in place, um, one important one, I think, is to attract the Chinese and the uh, Indian students to the national type schools is by making sure we have mother tongue education. We have the teaching of Mandarin and Tamil uh, in the national type schools. And I think this is a very important step because it allows every child to have a choice to learn another language, whether it's a Malay child or Chinese or Indian. And uh, if we can, uh, we can do this very well, I think um, parents will start coming back and thinking of one school because they know that uh, the mother tongue, they can still have their mother tongue because mother tongue is considered as the guardian or custodian of culture. And I think that's very important. Language is very important yes. in terms of your cultural being. What about indigenous groups? Um, I don't think there are languages. There might be in specific schools, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. For me, in particular in uh, UKM, uh, we are quite concerned about mother tongue, uh, the protection of mother tongue, because we believe this diversity has to be uh, preserved. So every year with the UNESCO um, celebration of uh, mother languages or mother tongue, mm -hmm. uh, we also have the same celebration in the university. And we make sure people are aware of this. And every time we have it, people are amazed to know 
that we have so many uh, uh, distinct uh, languages spoken in Sabah and Sarawak, for example. In, um, apart from Tamil and Mandarin, and even in Chinese, you have Hokkien, you have Cantonese, so there are variations. And even in the Malay language, you have distinct Kelantan, Kedah, Perak, and so on. And, you know, people come and they see the performance. And I think they, they are intrigued and uh, it, it makes them interested to know about this diversity in, 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 in Malaysia. And I think that's very important for us to promote. In 2007, Malaysia introduced a compulsory course on ethnic relations for university students across programs and faculties. The module is currently being used in 20 public universities involving some 70,000 students. Why is it that after 50 years of post-independence, multi-ethnic coexistence, this course is considered necessary? Okay, this is a bit more than mother tongue or language. Yeah? This is about, um, about the, the, the unique circumstances of how Malaysia came about and uh, how, why do we have this ethnic composition and why do we have special rights. It's about how the constitution was drafted and why it's drafted. And I think after a while, if we don't uh, conscientiously do this, uh, people may forget uh, why some things are enshrined in the Constitution. Several articles are written about this. It's not just about protection of the rights of everyone to religion and their mother tongue, but it's also the special privileges of the Malays, for example. So why this is uh, um, enshrined in our Constitution has to be understood by young people, and, and this is what we, we call the social contract. And this is not well understood sometimes, and it can be um, misinterpreted. And sometimes people exploit the situation for political and other purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think to avoid that, it is better for uh, young people to understand uh, in, in an intellectual way why certain things happen the way they happen and why this has to be written in the constitution. And the ethnic module is supposed to address this because it can be a source of conflict yeah, and tension if people don't understand because after several generations, people feel they are Malaysians. Uh, why do they have to be treated differently? And I can understand because I talk about this with my students. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, as long as there are inequalities, as long as there are still differences and gaps, I think we need to look at this uh, social contract and try to correct this. But I think we are doing quite well because, for example, admissions now, there's no more quota. Uh, we go on merit. Racial quota, you mean? Yeah, racial quota. Mm -hmm. Uh, we go on merit. Of course, you get more girls in. I know that's the next question. <laughs> uh, it used to be that we we have a quota for or for the bumiputra yes. and uh, non so non bumiputra, so to speak. But now it's not so anymore. Uh, as long as you qualify uh, based on the criteria, uh, which is actually merit based you get admission into the universities. So over the years, I think uh, as we go along, as we narrow the gaps, mm -hmm. um, I think we people will begin to understand um, that there might not be a need for certain protection. Yeah. Okay. We'll come to, back to the issue of gender parity in education. Malaysia has done well in achieving gender parity um, at the primary level. It's at 100%. At the secondary and tertiary level, there are more girls in school than boys. Now, this can be interpreted as an encouraging sign because worldwide, the majority of children out of school tend to be girls. Um, yet some people argue that the reverse gender gap in school is a cause for concern. Is there a merit to this argument? If you just look at it uh, as a f school, as in the academic school, uh, then that might be a cause of concern. But if you look at it uh, as boys probably dropping out, but they go into another stream, perhaps vocational. Yeah. Uh, overall, then it's not truly a dropout. You need people, uh, vocational skills. Skills are very important. Um, it complements the academic stream. So in this country, I think it is not a true dropout. 
So the boys may be choosing another stream and they probably will come back again uh, to the academic line, perhaps a bit later in their life. And if we subscribe to this um, lifelong learning, um, then I, I think it will even out. Because some people do want to go out uh, and, and experience what it's like outside, have a job and then come back. It's not that they don't qualify. And with our um, uh, system of recognition of prior learning, um, they, even though they don't have a high school certificate, for example, their experience, their work experience can be counted mm -hmm. uh, for them to continue with higher education. And I think this is a very enriching way of uh, getting diversity even in education and training. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is a limit to what formal education can achieve in terms of promoting social cohesion. For example, it cannot deter parents or families who are outside the school system from passing hatred and prejudice to young people at an early age. What mechanisms can be brought into play to promote respect and understanding among adults and those out of school? Yes, I, I agree. Education is not the only solution. Mm -hmm. And that's why the role of civil society is also very important. And I know what uh, civil society can do because we, we reach out to grassroots. We reach out to perhaps sometimes where the school cannot reach out, where government cannot reach. And uh, it's a powerful voice, it's a powerful movement that can work very quietly or it can work very noisily. Um, it can advocate or it can do a very good work, very good work quietly on the ground. And I think civil society has a big role to play in terms of modelling. Uh, for example, my own organisation, the National Council of Women, we make sure people understand what are our shared values. Mm -hmm. Because differences will always be there. So what do you share? You share values. And normally you cannot see values, you know. It's not like a building. But it touches the emotion. And I think this is where the cognition is one thing, emotion is another thing. And I think you need to work on the emotional aspects of um, uh, relationship. Uh, social behavior and so on. And I think it will go a long way because uh, from there will come mutual respect. If, uh, but respect can only come with a deep understanding. And deep understanding comes from experience. And sometimes experience you cannot get in the school, particularly race relations. You need to go out into the community to get this. And that's why there is, you need to link um, your formal education with the community. And community engagement is of prime importance in our university. In service to the community, uh, it's actually a social contract between the university and its um, and the taxpayers, you know, who pay for our upkeep. Um, our students actually learn a lot from the community, and when we have community engagement, they become the community becomes our classroom. And where do you learn social cohesion but in the community? Because the students go out there and they really see what it's like. And it's not just about seeing and being uh, non-active participants. They are engaged. They are actually doing projects or they're living with the families, foster families, for example, of a different ethnic group, talking to them, understanding what they do. Uh, I think these are powerful uh, teaching tools, tools and, uh, for students uh, to learn. Women's empowerment in Malaysia continue to continue to be disappointing in terms of proportion of women in parliament and in ministerial positions. The gender parity is at 10% for women in parliament and 12% for women ministers. Combined, the total ratio is about one woman to every nine men. So how can the number of women in political positions be increased? Uh, okay, firstly, I want to say it's important to have women. But... A number is not good enough. You must have women, they must be really good, and they must speak up, and they must show they are knowledgeable and they, uh, they can, can do the work that is expected. That's, that's very important, okay? We just don't want tokenism here. Okay, uh, why in other fields, in the professional fields in particular, I think the women are doing fairly well. Uh, in the academic setting, they're coming up quite well. Now, in politics, uh, as I understand it, okay, from the way I look at it, whenever there is power, uh, whenever it's perceived to be a way of 
uh, getting up and getting um, the prestige or, or whatever, um, women don't seem to be able to get it. It's only when politics is perceived as not being very important uh, to get to where you are, then the men, it does not matter whoever or even women can get on. And you can see this in some countries. Eh? Uh, suppose, for example, we say the alignment changes to business. And business is the way for us to move up and get things. And you'll find they'll abandon politics and go into business, those who want to struggle and get this. Uh, suppose we value knowledge and that's what you get rewarded for being knowledgeable, then everybody will jostle again for this. So I think it is about um, the recognition, about the importance being given and the reward, rewards that you get out of this. Women being... Um, I don't want to say they're timid, but women maybe have not got the skills of uh, pushing forward and, and being forthright. Uh, and the, the problem is sometimes when they are, when they are assertive, uh, they are called by another name. Yeah, Impressive. Yeah, so men. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so there is the cultural um, perception, um, barriers. Um, that women still have to, they are faced with this, they are challenged with this, and it's something we need to address. It's a long-term thing, uh, but I think we are making inroads. Uh, it might not be soon in the political field because that's really seen as a bountiful area. And those who want to go forward must be really very strategic in terms of how they want to uh, get there, up there in terms of politics. Uh, it's, I, I think it's very cultural and very um, uh, the perception, the myth, the tradition, the old age belief that um, there, there's a certain way for women to behave and a certain way for men to behave. And power is, politics is about power and it's not associated with women. That's right. So does that mean that we will not be seeing a female prime minister for a while in Malaysia? <laughs> Good question. Uh, you must have a pool. You must have a pool. We do have very competent women in Malaysia. Of course you have, but they're not in that immediate pool. Yes, they're not being given the opportunity to, to get into that yes. pool, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, on that note, we hope that there will be more opportunities for women's advancement in politics in Malaysia. Thank you for sharing Thank with you us your thoughts much. today. And that concludes our conversation with Dr. Sharifa Hafsa Said Hassan Shahabuddin, Vice Chancellor of University Kebangsaan Malaysia and President of the National Council of Women's Organization.